and uh, I welcome you all for our spring 2022 uh, Soil, Water and Climate Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Vasu Sharma. I'm the Irrigation Specialist in the Soil, Water and Climate Department, uh, and I'm co-organizing this seminar series with Dr. Kelly Wells and uh, Nancy Borman. Uh, some logistics. So uh, anyone can ask questions. You can unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can also type it in the chat box. Uh, we will be monitoring chat box throughout, so we will let Grant know if there are any questions. Uh, this session is being recorded, uh, and then we will put this recording on our seminar website. So if you want to see it later, uh, that will be available there. Uh, our first speaker today uh, is Dr. Grant Carden, who is a professor of soil science and extension soil specialist in the plant soils and climate department at the Utah State University. Uh, just a little update that Grant is right now doing sabbatical, right? And he is in the Midwest right now in Wisconsin, and he's going to be here in Minnesota in a couple of months, uh, later in the semester, uh, starting May, I guess. And he'll be here May and June. So hopefully if you want to you know, catch up, you can later uh, in the semester. Uh, today, his topic is improving tart cherry productivity and profitability through variable rate precision management. It's a new multi-state, multi-discipline project that he's going to be talking about today. So Grant, uh, stage is yours. Yeah, um, thank you, Vasu. Uh, she uh, had mentioned that the, I didn't get a little bio put together for you and a little, little bit about myself. I. I uh, I went to Utah State University for my BS in uh, 80, 82 to 86, and then on to the University of California, Riverside uh, in uh, soil physics uh, for my PhD. Worked with Dr. John Letty there, um, but uh, ended up at Colorado State University for about 14 years on the faculty at Colorado State. And then since 2005, we've been back at Utah State on the faculty there. I'm the extension soil specialist. Um, I, uh, I I had, when I first started there, a, a research and extension appointment. It was about 60-40 extension. But uh, as I've gotten older, they've given me more administrative responsibility. So I, I've been working as the associate department head and doing a lot more teaching. And so uh, as, as you get older, you get, I guess, more keys and more responsibility and, and those kinds of things, which is pretty natural. So it's great to actually uh, be out on sabbatical, a little short-term sabbatical. I'm at uh, University of Wisconsin right now, uh, working with Carrie Laboski and on soil fertility in her lab. And then I'll be up to kind of shadow Fabian and some of his work uh, when, uh, when I get back up there uh, in Minnesota in a couple of months. But um, I'm going to switch over uh, to my uh, my slides at this point, and you're going you're to lose my face, but I, hopefully my voice will still be there. <laughs> but uh, we'll get started with the presentation. Uh, in talking to Fabiani, he thought perhaps uh, this new project, uh, and Vasu, you're seeing my, my PowerPoint okay now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, this... Uh, new project that uh, we've got uh, that's just been recently funded by the USDA. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the team and, and, and some of the things that are going on there. But uh, this has actually come about um, due to a, a, a large number of uh, projects we've had over the last uh, about 12 years in, in tart cherry uh, production uh, in the state. Just to give you a little background uh, about um, Utah fruit industry, um, we do have actually quite a bit of fruit grown uh, in the state uh, compared to uh, some of the Midwestern states in Washington and, uh, and uh, in the South and things like that. Uh, we pale in, in, in area, but uh, really high value uh, because we, can, uh, uh, we have a lot of sunlight. <laughs> we have uh, a lot of frost-free uh, days in certain areas, and uh, we can produce really high quality fruit in, in some cases. Uh, tart cherries, peaches, apples, sweet cherries, and apricots are kind of the main ones uh, in the state that we produce. And they uh, represent a very uh, high value uh, segment of our agricultural production uh, in Utah. In fact, uh, tart cherries uh, is the state's highest value crop, highest uh, area crop as well. And uh, we uh, are number two behind Michigan in terms of production. In fact, uh, if uh, Michigan gets froze out, we'll occasionally slip to number one. But uh, 
Um, we typically are number, number two in the nation in, in tart cherry production. And as you might expect, uh, these crops are those in the state that are in some of the highest production cost uh, regimes, um, both in the management of the fruit itself and the handling of the fruit, but uh, lots of pest control, lots of uh, 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 hand labor and pruning and, 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 and tree management and other things. So there's a lot of production costs that go in there and increasingly now uh, very expensive fertilizer inputs that uh, the growers are, are looking to, to try to optimize in, in, in more efficient ways. And so they're looking to, uh, to obviously increase their productivity and, and their profit margins. And that can come about in a number of different ways through higher yields, uh, through improvements in fruit quality, in improvements in uh, longevity of the uh, of the orchards, and being able to produce, uh, uh, you know, uh, efficiently uh, over uh, more years uh, on a uh, on an orchard. So there's all kinds of different things that we could look to try to optimize. They're not just yield, but uh, um, they do get um, premiums in terms of quality and, uh, and longevity of the orchards. If we take a look at the state, um, we've got about uh, 3,200 hectares of, of, uh, of fruit production. And you can see tart cherry there being uh, nearly half of the area. Um, peaches is the, uh, the next uh, largest, uh, and then apples, with some minor crops uh, scattered about the state. But in terms of value, um, it represents about $23 million in uh, farm income. Uh, net uh, income actually in, in the state, um, about 9.2 million uh, in tart cherry production alone. And if you look at that on a value per hectare, um, our tart cherries are about $7,000 <clears> per hectare in terms of its value to the state. So these are, these are uh, not only uh, high input crops, but they uh, have high potential return for the growers. And so we have a lot of very well organized uh, fruit groups, uh, commodity groups throughout the state in the different, uh, in the different fruits that uh, work together to, uh, to leverage um, their income quite effectively. And so I'll talk a little bit about that as we get into this project and how we involve them and, uh, and their co-ops in this process. Um, my experience with uh, fruit fertility management uh, it has been over the last 12 years, I, I got involved with Dr. Brent Black, who is our uh, uh, extension fruit specialist in, in looking at uh, phosphorus and potassium management in these various fruits. Um, our soil tests were indicating uh, nutrient sufficiency in terms of the levels of sufficiency, but our tissue tests often indicated nutrient deficiencies. So there was a disconnect there somewhere in uh, how well the, the trees were able to uh, access the nutrients, take them up and so forth. And so we started getting into this, uh, particularly in apples, uh, looking at uh, calcium deficiencies and remedying some of those with uh, phosphorus and potassium management. And uh, we began to focus on tart cherries for a, a couple of different reasons. Um, number one, I, I mentioned just a minute ago that uh, we have you know, really well organized uh, commodity groups, co-ops in these different fruits. T uh, tart cherries by, by far and away is the most organized. Uh, Pace and Fruit Growers uh, is, is the primary co-op. Uh, it involves all these growers across uh, a couple of different uh, county areas in, in the state. Um, Pace and Fruit Growers actually serves as um, one of the main processors for even uh, the, the tart cherries that are produced in Michigan. Uh, they have a large uh, cherry drying operation where a lot of the, the fresh fruit from both Utah and Michigan are brought for for uh, for drying and processing. And a lot of what you see in terms of dry cherry uh, it, utilization uh, around the country, even in the world, actually at one point or another probably comes through Utah, even if it's produced in, in, in other areas. Um, the growers were very interested when we started looking at uh, P and K management, that they thought that there could be uh, some real opportunity to improve their fruit quality 
um, particularly when it comes to dried cherries, trying to increase bricks content and other things, the sugar content and things like that to, to make it more of a, an appealing and marketable product. So we started looking at, as a lot of fertility specialists will do, um, you know, rate response trials, formulation trials with the various uh, products that are out there and available for phosphorus and potassium management. Um, and the study that I'm going to talk about kind of comes about from some of this initial work that we were doing with phosphorus and potassium. So let me kind of give you a, a, a little outline. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the data from these previous studies, but uh, I, I wanted to bring them up because it, it, it indicates how this kind of leveraged what um, uh, we're now doing with the variable rate management uh, approach. Um, in these previous studies back in 2010 and 11, we, we chose five large production um, cherry blocks uh, in Utah County and uh, established both rate response trials at, at the sites and formulation comparisons. I'm not gonna really talk about the formulation comparisons, but uh, I just wanted to kind of go over the different sites that were involved because there's some uh, characteristics of these sites that actually uh, figures into uh, kind of the foundational impetus for this variable rate study. Um, we had, again, five, five blocks, production blocks that were chosen. Um, and you can see that they were all about 15 to 20 year old trees in those blocks, which is pretty, uh, pretty close to the kind of the peak production uh, range of the ages of these trees. So they were all within peak production levels, or they should be um, based on their age. But you'll notice that one of the main differentiating characteristics in these is the way nutrients had been managed uh, uh, pre, uh, uh, pre previous to these studies that we established. So on site A, this was uh, a block that received uh, pretty aggressive annual nutrient management, uh, uh, fertility uh, management each year. You know, applying fertilizer uh, regularly to the trees was was uh, maintained at, at this uh, particular block. Where site uh, B and D uh, were only occasionally uh, given fertilizer, and typically only when. Uh, an obvious expressed deficiency in the trees uh, was evident. Um, and so they didn't receive it annually. They may have received it, uh, you know, one or two years out of three or four, depending on the, the, some of the expressed need that, 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 that the grower could see. And then sites C and E were interesting because they received almost no nutrient management at all, uh, very infrequent, if any. A fertilizer application. And so they put these orchards in, they established the orchards, and we, they just let them basically uh, go on their own, except for pruning and, and, uh, and orchard floor management and, and those kinds of things. So there was some differential uh, management history in, 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 uh, in nutrient application in these. Um, just to really quickly uh, mention the, the different uh, treatments in the rate response, uh, we did a series of applications uh, of uh, control, receiving no uh, fertilizer, uh, and then a half, one pound and two pounds of uh, triple 16 per tree. Uh, nitrogen was held constant across the study so that we didn't have compounding issues uh, with uh, end management. But when we take all of those different sites together and uh, we lump the data uh, together in those and, and analyze for uh, differences according to the various rates that were applied, we saw no significant differences um, uh, at all between the different uh, rates of application. And being an agronomist originally and, and not working with horticultural crops, particularly perennial tree crops like this, um, you would expect uh, typically uh, some kind of um, uh, in, in the year of application response uh, to uh, applied nutrients, especially in situations where you uh, figured that they would be in some kind of deficit. Um, and so not seeing, uh, you know, the in year of application response uh, in, in a couple of years running uh, on some of these sites, um, 
it, it was a little uh, disheartening. How do we how do we evaluate what's going on uh, in these? And it wasn't until we uh, basically stratified our analysis and looking at uh, management history as a way of kind of dividing out what was going on that we really did see things. And so I, I, I put this uh, graph in here showing um, at the top uh, kind of the, the the rate response curve for that block that was annually fertilized. The uh, the middle graph are the two sites uh, taken on average um, of those that were occasionally fertilized. And then the, the bottom curve there is the rate response uh, in the orchard that the orchard, the two orchard blocks that rarely received uh, any fertility. And when we did that, we could see that there were significant differences uh, in rate response uh, in those that uh, did not receive annual uh, application um, of nutrients. Um, that was interesting to us because then we could kind of refine maybe some of the recommendations uh, based on uh, what the uh, annual application rate ought to be in, in these orchards. But uh, the thing that really stood out uh, to us um, in this was the uh, the clear differences in base productivity uh, of the orchards based on their nutrient management history, um, and and these ratios of of uh, of the the yields uh, maintained even in lower yielding years, there was still this separation. Um, where those trees that received annual uh, fertility management uh, had a much higher base productivity than uh, even those that were uh, occasionally uh, fertilized and well above those that were never fertilized um, or, or very infrequently. And so when we looked at this, we thought, well, there's opportunity here um, for uh, really looking at um, uh, some uh, variable rate management. If there's areas in the in, in the in, in an orchard where the conditions are such that um, fertility is rather low, or for whatever reason uh, the, the trees aren't as productive, or other things, th there's potentially um, um, a, a real advantage to uh, trying to optimize uh, fertility management within areas that uh, may suffer for fertility uh, so that the, uh, the, the the base of productivity within an orchard overall can can be increased. And so that's what really kind of um, propelled us into this idea uh, of putting this uh, project together. This was just funded this last year. We start uh, all of our uh, experimentation on this uh, this spring uh, coming up. It's a, a grant through the USDA specialty crop research initi initiative, similar title to that that I'm presenting today. Uh, two million uh, over, over four years, it involves both Utah State and Michigan State University. So I thought just for a quick uh, little bit here, uh, I would introduce the team and, uh, and the different things that each will be contributing uh, to the effort. And then I wanna talk about uh, some of the proof of concept work we've been doing over the last, 10 years or so, uh, as, as we kind of got this idea that there was opportunity for, for variable rate management that, that kind of served as a foundation upon which we built uh, the proposal for, for, this, uh, for this grant. So uh, it, I'll introduce the, the Michigan State team first. Um, Todd Einhorn uh, at Michigan State is uh, our horticulture and orchard system specialist there. Um, he will be the, the primary horticulturist uh, on, on the group uh, for Michigan State. Interestingly enough, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of cross-pollination in, in this world of, of, uh, uh, of nutrient management and, and so forth. I, I sat on uh, Todd's uh, PhD committee at Colorado State University um, when he was working on his PhD uh, quite, a, quite a while back. So it, it'll be fun to, to, to cross back over with him in, in, a, in a collegial way. Uh, Bruno Basso uh, is an engineer, works with precision ag and, and remote sensing uh, in, in orchard systems at, at Michigan State. Uh, Nikki Rothwell is the IPM uh, specialist there. Uh, we wanted to uh, bring not only um, 
fertility, production, uh, fruit quality, and other things, but also pest management into all of these. And of course, then to also keep track of, uh, of the, the overall economics as the profitability aspects of, of this were uh, of uh, real critical interest. So Molly Woods uh, is the economist that will be working on the team at uh, Michigan State University. Um, at Utah State, uh, Brent Black, I mentioned Brent earlier, is uh, one that I've cooperated a lot with over the years. Brent is our extension fruit specialist, and he's the principal on this entire project. Uh, he's kind of organized the group and put us together as teams and was the, the interface on, on, on the proposal. Um, he works with all of our fruit co-ops, particularly the tart cherry co-ops in the state. And so he's our, our, our point guy uh, on the project. Um, many of you might know Matt Yost. Matt uh, was at Missouri for a long time with uh, Bill Kitchen. Uh, and so he, uh, we hired him about four or five years ago um, as our extension um, Agroclimate specialist, he does a lot of work with water conservation, uh, precision irrigation management, uh, but he's uh, a, a good agronomist too uh, in his background there. Uh, Alfonso Torres is uh, in the engineering department and, and actually he, uh, he runs what uh, we call, there's a service on campus called Aggie Air. And Aggie Air is a, uh, a a service organization on campus that actually contracts with a number of different uh, um, uh, cor corporations and companies and things to do remote sensing. Um, they've got a lot of uh, fixed wing and, uh, and uh, drone uh, technologies that they can help deploy to these. And so he'll be uh, our, our point on, on remote sensing and uh, feeding primarily into a lot of the, the management uh, areas that we do in, in, in precision irrigation with his engineering background. Um, I might also add that Alfonso uh, maintains access to a number of different uh, satellite uh, databases. And so we have opportunity to tie uh, what we're doing uh, in, in local remote sensing to some larger scale Landsat and, and, uh, and other databases uh, available to us that way as well. Marion Murray, uh, pictured just to my right, uh, is uh, our pest management specialist in extension, and she'll be working uh, on, on those aspects of the project. I'm the, the dirt doctor on the group and uh, will be working with uh, the fertility uh, management, uh, the, the mapping of the soil properties and so forth. And then uh, Bailey Schaefer um, is an industry specialist. He's going to be working with us. Uh, he uh, is a former graduate student and technician of mine, uh, but he now works uh, for Apogee Instruments as an instrument development and, uh, and testing specialist with, with them. And, and he'll be working with us a lot on, on some of the remote sensing platforms. And then uh, Kailara Pappenfuss uh, is our... Um, co-op connection. Uh, she, uh, she works for Payson Fruit Growers um, and she's one of their primary uh, field uh, consultants. Kailara is a former uh, master's student of Dr. Brent Black's and so she's our inside person with, uh, with the fruit growers, which is fantastic because she helps us with uh, grower interface and uh, field and site selection. She'll be doing a lot of our pest scouting uh, uh, as far as the uh, the IPM um, work that we're doing on these orchards as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, take a quick sip. So that's the team um, that we'll be working together. And that's, you know, brings all these different disciplines together in this idea of working on precision management. Now, you folks there at Minnesota are not um, novices when it comes to precision management. We just had uh, Dr. Dave Mullah uh, make a presentation of this, the, uh, you know, the precision uh, management, the agricultural uh, management center there at the university uh, uh, gave us a, a presentation at Utah State here last semester. And, and so you guys are well aware of, of what precision management involves. Um, but this idea that uh, you can, uh, begin to uh, look at correlations between uh, various uh, compounding factors that uh, uh, 
uh, are integrated in, in the yield or the productivity or the performance, longevity and so forth of, of agricultural production. And uh, you begin to get the correlations between these things that uh, you can develop uh, very site-specific precision management. And now we think about it in an agronomic sense, uh, we're looking at things like soil properties, nutrient distribution, yield history, pest distribution, and so forth, and how they correlate. And uh, trying to develop from that information and uh, prescriptive uh, management at any given location. And in an agronomic setting, we might be talking about seeding rate var var uh, var variation uh, using different varieties based on pest pressures in different uh, different settings or conditions, fertilizer rates over the uh, for over the area. And then uh, pest outbreak and, and scouting for uh, uh, you know, uh, thresholds and things for pesticide application and, and so forth that then can be uh, specifically targeted to areas uh, of need. But in orchards, um, we have uh, kind of another level of, of, uh, of geometry uh, that we need to account for uh, in, in the way things uh, um, work together in these different layers uh, in a precision uh, application uh, approach. Um, there's a lot of variability within the orchards, not only in soils, but in uh, tree vigor, uh, uh, individual uh, uh, pest uh, uh, pressures on, on, on trees that may be uh, weakened in some way or another in the orchard. There's uh, the pruning uh, variability and, and, uh, and light penetration through the canopy and, and what have you. So there's some additional layers of information that are needed when we apply variable rate technology um, to uh, uh, orchard settings um, in order to develop and, and, and test these uh, area specific management uh, procedures. So what I thought I'd do here is kind of outline for you some of the, um, the uh, foundational work, the, the proof of concept work, uh, if you will, uh, that we've been doing over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so to kind of begin to build um, uh, the, the foundation for which we, we pitched uh, this uh, large scale project. Um, in the West, in, in, in our soils, uh, soil salinity is always a perturbing issue with, uh, with crop productivity. And so we want to know what the, the variability in, in the soil salinity is across uh, a field, an orchard, in this case, block. Um, you know, uh, trying to grow crops in a, in a desert, uh, in a, in a uh, water short condition, you always have uh, evapoconcentration of solutes. So you, you have to deal with salinity pretty regularly. And then, of course, uh, looking at uh, soil texture, um, from a standpoint of water and nutrient holding capacities and the changes that happen there, uh, depending on clay content, sand content, and what have you. So we're applying uh, electromagnetic induction as the primary way of, of uh, looking at those soil properties. Um, we'll pull uh, electromagnetic induction uh, meter through and, and, and uh, get bulk conductivity maps. Uh, this is an example uh, map of, a, of an orchard block uh, where we've done just that. Um, darker colors uh, being uh, finer textured, lighter colors, uh, uh, sandier textures and so forth. And so less uh, water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity and other things. And so you see some structure that you can then observe uh, with uh, this remote sensing technique of the soil properties. Now, uh, in order to uh, get the correlations to specific properties, we need to go back in and, and uh, take uh, physical measurements, uh, soil samples, and, uh, and do the correlations between bulk conductivity and, and these different uh, characteristics. Um, but I'm showing here uh, the bulk conductivity map on the right that, that gives you uh, at least a, 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 a remedial idea of what uh, 
the map will will end up looking like. And I want you to remember this particular map. And the reason I put it up there is that uh, when we look at some of the other remote sensing techniques that we're deploying to, to gather these data layers, uh, this particular field shows up uh, in in uh, in some of the other slides that I'll show, and, and you can see the correlation there. But you can roughly see kind of the, the at least the soil properties distribution uh, across this field with uh, this EMI sensor. Um, of course, when we're talking about water holding and nutrient holding capacity differences uh, based on soil properties, then we can then look at uh, this base map as an opportunity to develop variable rates for both irrigation and fertilizer application. And what exactly, you know, uh, are the are the um, the the best ways of, of deploying that variable uh, rate application? Um, that then is a, a, a the, the next step in kind of deciding how this will be handled in the field. Um, but at least we can begin to look at, at management zones needing uh, attention in, in those areas. The other, uh, and other, not just the other, but another area in which we're taking uh, some of this uh, data for developing these layers that will then be correlated uh, in our management approach is uh, aerial imaging. <laughs> and um, not only in the visible spectrum, the RGB uh, uh, spectra uh, uh, there that we commonly will, will look at, you know, with our, with our eyes, our eyeballs uh, on the field, but uh, in other uh, uh, wavelengths as well. But here you can see um, just a, a, uh, an overflow, a flyover uh, aerial image of the orchard block that uh, we did, I showed you the, in the last slide had the, uh, the soil properties map. And uh, what we initially get excited about is, is that we can see at least um, anecdotally here a little bit, not statistically yet, uh, but anecdotally we can see some of the, uh, the effects on the orchard block uh, maybe that are uh, influenced by uh, the soil properties uh, that we saw mapped in the previous slide where you can see some of the structure of the orchard reflecting uh, some of the differences in, in soil properties that we saw previously. But one of the things that really astounds me, um, and, and this is something I didn't realize was, was possible until we started doing this aerial imaging is that when you're doing these flyovers um, with the fixed wing or the copter type uh, drones that we've got shown here, is you're sampling at such a high rate of, uh, of sampling uh, as you do these patterned flyovers uh, on these orchard blocks. You're able to see uh, each individual tree from multiple angles of perspective. And in post-processing, you can actually use that uh, point cloud that you've developed on, on an individual tree. Um, sorry, advance this the right way to actually look at uh, tree size and shape. So the, the image that you're seeing uh, on the upper right-hand corner there is the same orchard block with some of the holes there in the canopy that uh, you, you see uh, expressed in the... Uh, the, the, the planar aerial image um, showing the actual uh, tree size and, and shape. You can get uh, canopy volume um, from uh, an image like this that's been processed uh, with this uh, point cloud approach with the aerial imaging uh, that, that, that is done. And this excites us a lot because uh, from this we can, we can really get uh, uh, canopy structure, we can get health of the trees in terms of the size, we can even you know, zero in and look at individual trees and, 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 and holes in the orchard and, and things like that and where they're occurring and, and, uh, and, and maybe tease out some additional information that would be important to, to this uh, management approach. Um, another uh, aspect of uh, data collection and the data layers that we're, we're putting together is uh, is canopy density. Um, when we look at uh, canopy density, uh, it, 
it's it's best determined by light uh, transmission through the canopy um, and light uh, capture uh, by the canopy in general. And so uh, we, we've put together um, with the help of Apogee Instruments, uh, a, uh, a mobile um, septometer uh, system where we can take a look at uh, light penetration through the canopy. Um, you can see uh, the septometer there on the far left uh, that's developed, uh, currently available uh, from Apogee. Apogee is actually doing some changes to their um, device to, to actually uh, make it uh, work better in this particular uh, application. But um, it has uh, multiple uh, PAR sensors, uh, photosynthetic active radiation sensors uh, along its length. I think there's eight individual sensors along length of about 15 inches long uh, septometer. And then that uh, uh, received radiation is, is, uh, is averaged over the length of the device. And so across the orchard floor, we have taken um, an old uh, orchard spray uh, unit's uh, chassis and uh, to the boom that would normally have been the spray boom, affixed uh, a number of these uh, septometers side by side across the, the width of the tree spacing. And then that's towed uh, through the orchard. Um, in the close up there, you can see uh, it's got a little GPS antenna in the middle of it. And so uh, with some correction from that point to the midpoint of each of the different septometers, we can then have an average reading across uh, eight different points uh, underneath uh, the canopy, resulting uh, in, uh, in light penetration data uh, in, in the orchard. This is referenced then to uh, light levels measured simultaneously outside of the orchard so that we get a relative difference in light penetration uh, within the canopy. And so these are the maps that we see uh, of light interception. Um, we've uh, put them together histogramically here. Uh, so you can see 80 to 100% uh, is the dark green down to 0% is the red. And this first map uh, right in the middle um, on the left hand of all the other maps is that same orchard you've seen previously in the uh, in the the EMI map for the soil properties and in the aerial imagery, and so uh, again, we're excited here that the light interception data uh, is picking up uh, that same structure, reproducing some of that same structure that we've seen repeatedly in these other uh, data layers, and so we're excited about the opportunity to really uh, use these in in correlation to one another to then look at prescriptive management within, within the orchard. The other thing that uh, this brings up um, is uh, looking at um, opportunities for improving uh, the actual density of the canopy, not just reflecting what uh, the soil properties or the pest pressures or other things are having on light interception, but what is our management tree to tree uh, in terms of pruning and 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 uh, and structure development and things within within the within the, the tree uh, doing in terms of the uh, optimizing the, the light interception um, too little light intercepted leaves uh, energy on the table that could otherwise be converted uh, uh, to production too much interception means that uh, the lower parts of the canopy aren't getting enough light for the, the, the fruit to ripen properly. That fruit uh, is of lower quality because of that, because it's not getting the energy that it needs. Um, inadequate bloom, uh, differential bloom throughout the canopy will happen uh, if you have uh, too much uh, uh, light interception, too dense of a, of a canopy. Um, Pests and diseases will uh, begin to manifest in these denser areas within, within uh, the orchard as well. And so, um, you know, optimizing the, the actual uh, canopy density uh, will be a, an interesting aspect of it. We don't know really what it is. Um, and so we're looking for opportunities in terms of uh, um, uh, 
in, in terms of pruning uh, uh, strategies and, and things like that, uh, uh, how does our pruning affect light interception? And can we optimize pruning strategies in order to do that? And will that then help with the longevity of the orchards as well? So that's another aspect of this that uh, we hope will uh, emerge from, from what we're doing. Uh, then, of course, one of the key uh, elements in tying this all together is uh, yield, the productivity actually uh, of, of, the, uh, of the orchard itself. And so um, I, I'm sure that uh, this might be a review for, for many of you, um, but I thought for a minute, uh, I, I'd just remind you of, of the methods for harvesting cherries, um, where each individual tree is shaken in order to release the fruit. Um, I'm going to run this little video. There's a couple of aspects of this I, I want you to pay close attention to, and I'll hopefully my cursor is visible. Um, the machine on the left-hand side here is the one that comes up and uh, clamps uh, at the base of the tree and uh, does the shaking. The right-hand machine uh, is companion to the capture. Uh, it, it captures a fruit falling on this side of the tree, but it also has a uh, conveyor system here that then conveys the fruit up and into uh, the storage bin at the back. Now the storage bin is full of water at first, but as the cherries enter the bin, it displaces the water, the water dumps out and you're left with the, with the, 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 the cherries in, in the cold water. Um, the cold water helps to harden or, or firm the cherry uh, flesh so that when it goes through the pitting uh, uh, process and stuff like that, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mash it. But um, harvest then is, is, is tree to tree, but uh, an individual bin uh, may contain the fruit of several trees. Um, and depending on the fruit load or the productivity of an orchard, that may be two or three trees per bin. It could be as many as five or seven trees per bin, uh, depending on, uh, on what the crop load is. And so it, it, it introduces some unique challenges to actually mapping the yield uh, in this because we don't get necessarily uh, individual um, tree yields. So let me show you what we've been doing. Uh, I'm just gonna run this so you can remind yourself how this works and it's fascinating to me. So as this is progressing, uh, you'll see that the, this machine will dump the cherries gathered into a conveyor. The conveyor belt will then uh, pull the cherries up uh, and into the bin. There's a blower that gets rid of some of the leaves and twigs and so forth. But you can see the cherries then falling in uh, to, to the bin as it moves into, lo into the next position for the, for the following tree. Um, Remember that because it's important to some of the things that we're going to be uh, working on to, uh, to to better map yields uh, uh, in these orchards. So uh, our yield mapping has been a, a bit of a challenge. How, how do you record that? Uh, early on, um, we were walking behind uh, the uh, the shakers, and uh, we with a with a, a, a a float plate. Um, we were trying to determine what the level of the cherries were, uh, you know, as they compact down in, in, in each of the bins after each tree and trying to record that. That was really labor intensive and difficult, to, uh, not an easy thing to, to obviously automate in any way. So uh, Bailey Schaefer, who's uh, working with Apogee Instruments, when he was my technician, developed uh, kind of a a, uh, a device, not kind of a device, developed a little device to, to be able to, uh, to detect when uh, the shaker uh, changed or exchanged the bin on the back of the, on the, back of the device. And so it was just a simple little uh, spring-loaded spring arm that uh, when a new bin was placed in there, it would close the switch. When the bin was taken off to replace it with a new one, uh, it would open the switch, and when it was open, 
uh, the device would activate a little Arduino computer that then would activate the GPS uh, data collection to determine where the site of that bin drop had occurred. Uh, and so by doing that, we were able to automate uh, how often and where in the orchard they were dropping bins. And so you can see the, the, the map here of um, each of those bin drops as the machine goes throughout the, the orchard block. Um, using that information and the, uh, the weight of each of the bins, uh, we could actually then formulate a, a rudimentary yield map um, uh, based on the, the, the density of those uh, those positions, the, the, the bin drop positions and the average weight of each bin as it was taken back into the, 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 the pitting facility. And so this enabled us to, to more readily automate um, the, uh, the yield mapping. And uh, so we've been, we've been trying to develop this and improve the design of this, as you might expect. Um, one of the problems with this is there's a lot of moving devices. There's uh, the need to make sure that the, 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 the bin settles in and activates the switch. The swing arm, the, the spring swing arm may disconnect or break or other things during the process of the shaking. And there's all kinds of issues with, with moving parts. Plus we're not getting like I said before, uh, a specific tree by tree uh, yield measurement. So one of the things we've been doing is to really like do some more precise approaches uh, to, to, to look at individual trees if we can. Um, we we'll had this little video showing the activation of that, but I think it's uh, redundant here. I'll go on to the next slide. Um, we've been working with uh, uh, Juniper Systems, uh, based there in Logan. Uh, Juniper Systems, you might be familiar with, uh, puts together the Harvest Master uh, yield monitors that are uh, typically attached to uh, grain combines. Uh, but they also have um, developed a, 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 a Harvest Master uh, yield monitoring system for potato uh, harvest, um, where it's actually a, a, a conveyor um, uh, system where there's load cell cells attached uh, to the conveyor belt itself and a, uh, a speed wheel with which it, it can determine how fast the conveyor is working or moving so that uh, you know, it, it, any given length of, uh, of, of conveyor uh, weighs a certain amount that they can actually then do uh, continuous yield monitoring uh, as the device moves through the field. Um, and, and this is exciting to us. If we could get this uh, worked out that we can attach these then to these conveyor belts on the harvesters as the conveyor belt then uh, places the fruit into the bin um, between trees, it takes about a full uh, uh, movement of the machine from one place to the next to empty that conveyor, which is actually uh, convenient to us because then we can measure uh, individual tree yields if we can get this uh, to work. So this is down the road a little ways working with Juniper Systems. But to minimize the, uh, the current conundrum that we have with a lot of moving parts on, on our, our, our bin counting uh, approach, um, we're in the process of putting together a, a, a new proximity uh, sensor that be, can be attached to the, uh, the, the uh, the forklift on the back of the shaker. These are uh, basically the devices used on, the, on your newer cars with the backup alarms, these little proximity sensors. Uh, they can be aimed so that you can limit their view to uh, no more than one meter, easily programmed uh, with a data logger, and uh, they can be set up so that if there's no detection uh, or no activation of the proximity sensor for 30 seconds, and the data logger will automatically report uh, or record a, a GPS coordinate, uh, noting uh, the exchange of a bin in that particular location. The nice thing about this is that there's absolutely no moving parts. We can recess these on a, a bar. We can easily attach uh, to the, the forklift part of the shaker. And I think this will get us over the first bridge of, of having too many moving parts in our yield mapping. So we're taking all of this data together, 
the soil properties, the aerial imaging, both the uh, the visible uh, as well as uh, on these uh, on these drones, uh, we've got uh, a, a red edge camera uh, available so that we can take uh, red edge and near infrared uh, uh, measurements as well. We can put that together in in uh, some of the the crop indices, NDVI, and so forth. Um, we can look at uh, water stress and and uh, um, pest uh, stress and, and those kinds of things. Uh, septometry to, to look at uh, light penetration uh, as a surrogate for crop density. Uh, tank drops at this point uh, uh, for uh, for yield but moving hopefully towards more of a, a tree by tree uh, yield monitoring capability as we move uh, further into this project. And then ground scouting uh, uh, maps of uh, pest incidents and outbreaks within the field that can form a, an additional layer of information to feed into our, uh, our prescriptive management. Um, there's a number of different things we can look at with all of this data. Of course, soil uh, versus canopy volume and density, uh, soil conditions and yield potential and so forth, but also then canopy density and fruit quality and, and uh, pest outbreaks and other things, as I mentioned. I haven't said anything about root distribution, but there's an opportunity then to look at even root uh, structure and, and uh, geometry and uh, use that as an additional layer of information that uh, might be applicable to this um, in developing these uh, site-specific uh, prescriptions to compensate for that variability and all of these things. And again, I mentioned uh, even uh, doing some additional experiments on how uh, orchard management, particularly pruning, uh, would affect the out, uh, outcome. And, and uh, then also making recommendations for orchard re renewal, uh, whether that be replanting in, uh, in areas that are waning, uh, that we can see issues with uh, plant uh, vigor beginning to occur, um, even to the extent of when is it, uh, when is it most efficient to, to remove and, and replant an orchard block completely. The nice thing about <laughs> um, having uh, an industry that has a lot of industry cooperation already built into it is that we can tap into that uh, for um, really facilitating uh, the cooperation that's that's necessary uh, to not only to gain access to the orchard sites but to draw from our cooperators on additional objectives uh, different approaches ideas um, it's it's amazing to me how uh, thoughtful uh, these growers are. Um, this is their livelihood. They spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about things that they can do better and, and how they might do them. And and uh, that kind of feedback is is critical in, in in these kinds of approaches. And so we've taken advantage and leveraged uh, that by getting representation on uh, this project from uh, those grower cooperators, uh, from the organizations, the, the co-op leaders and, and things like that to form evaluation uh, and advisory committees uh, to provide us that input. And uh, you can see that we've got uh, grower representatives in, in Michigan, all over Michigan in the fruit producing uh, regions, in Utah from Washington, um, Wisconsin here and in New York, um, some of the fruit processors, we have extension agents, uh, and other researchers involved. And uh, we plan to be doing um, annual advisory committee meetings uh, once a year in either Grand Rapids or, or Traverse City uh, in your neighborhood, not too far away. So, uh, you know, when we get uh, involved in this and, and maybe do some of the, uh, the uh, progress updates and things like that, it, it might be interesting to, to even provide some of that uh, data to those that might be interested uh, in in uh, in your state as well. So uh, with that, um, I think I've uh, taken my time. Um, we can. Uh, I'm going to switch over so you can actually see. And I can see you, and you can see me. Um, are there any uh, Are there any questions?
Yeah, Grant, uh, I got a question. Uh, what, maybe Carl uh, might know this. What's the extent of uh, sour cherries in Minnesota? Uh, I don't, we may have one or two orchards, but. What did you uh, say, Carl? Maybe one or two orchards, but it's okay. not very um, prevalent, mostly backyards. <laughs> But there are quite a few in Wisconsin, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, by, by Green Bay, there's a whole industry of tart cherries up there. Um, it just hasn't caught on here. Um, I'm for sure I don't think there'd be any of that automated. I think probably it's because of the automation. I, I don't think there's any automation here for that. So that's probably a limiting factor. Yeah. I've got one. In, I've Amy got one in my got backyard. Two. I've got one in my backyard too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, they make really good jam and pies. Yeah. So I, the, I do uh, have a, a question. Um, yes. Yeah. Related to the the talk. Um, so you did um, salinity mapping. Um, did, what what do you do with the the data that you collect? Do you remediate the soil, or you just say, okay, those are the areas that are going to have lower yields, or or what do you do with it? Um, the, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> so yeah, we 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 would look at trying to accomplish uh, either or both um, to to try to uh, increase leaching fractions in certain areas that might need some remediation uh, in terms of salinity or. Uh, just accounting for it in uh, in selecting maybe rootstocks that are a little bit more saline tolerant and things like that. Right now, most of, of what we have is a is a single rootstock, but there may be opportunity for you know looking into that down the road. If people, particularly and um, as you might expect, most of our fruit production has been on uh, the the uh, the foot slopes. Uh, of the of the mountains around the valleys uh, where good air drainage and things like that is available and and most of those soils are are fairly coarse textured soils really well suited to orchard production mm -hmm. but that's where everybody wants to plant their houses now uh, is on those foot slopes those view areas and whatnot so we're getting a lot of of our orchards pushed out into the valleys um, which they're poorer quality soils, they're you know finer textured soils, they're higher saline content soils, and and so you know there might be uh, a need to really uh, start exploring uh, you know new rootstocks and, and things like that that are a little bit more tolerant. Um, do, do you have a sodium problem, or is it just salinity, or is it? Uh, it, it can be both. So sodium uh, is an issue, particularly in some of the lowest points of the valleys mm -hmm. where you get um, uh, a lot of subbing of, of saline groundwater back up to the surface right. and, and things like that. And in certain areas where uh, old marine shales are exposed, uh, which we do have quite a few of running Manco's shale and other places where we have uh, more of the sodium uh, sulfate uh, salts that are deposited in those. those. So th they'll show up in places. Um, but most of it is, you know, uh, gypsum, uh, mm -hmm. cal calcium chloride, uh, salts, and things like that that mm -hmm. are, are fairly soluble and easy to manage if you can manage the yeah. drainage in, in some right. of those uh, yeah. valley soils. Yeah. 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 The sodium presents major problem if it's there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah it can't, it can, uh, it, it, you know, just the whole idea of soil structure maintenance and things right. like that, the dispersion issues that it causes. Sure. Yeah, it's a problem, but uh, yeah. Any other questions? Grant, I have a question. Thank for the presentation. Yep. Um, you were showing some pictures there, and I thought, well, you know, it's very ar arid over there. And um, I saw the grassy ways in the orchards. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, well, maybe related, maybe not, but, you know, how, how is the water situation there is it uh, drip irrigation um and or is there fertigation too and um my main question though is related to okay so you have those grassy ways uh do they i assume that they outweigh the um the competition for water compared to some of the other abiotic and abiotic stresses that uh, 
will be presented if you don't have those grassy ways? Yeah, um, it, it's been interesting. There's been a lot of work done on on uh, the sustainability recently of of orchard floor management and uh, and how you you know try to decrease some of the competition that happens there. But you'll notice that uh, all of those um, have uh, in the tree line uh, about a three to four foot wide you know, uh, well-managed, you know, uh, weed-free, uh, plant-free area. And most of the irrigation and, and fertilizer application takes place within that weed-free area. So these are typically irrigated by uh, micro sprinklers. Um, and fertigation also happens uh, within these areas. Uh, so there is some water that gets out into uh, to the grassy area, but most of the time it, it's it, it's fairly well maintained on uh, on just what it gets from uh, <coughs> spring or uh, winter water storage in the soils and and, and some of that overshot of uh, uh, of the micro sprinklers. Um, but we don't see a lot of competition from from the orchard floor uh, because it's you know so much focused into that weed free area within the tree, the, the, the fertile, fertility is all applied there, uh, very little out into the, the grassy way and, and so forth there. But there's a big advantage uh, when it comes to uh, doing operations within the orchard, if you have a grass uh, orchard way, because the, you know, the sprayers and, and the, the pruning platforms and other things uh, operate so much better where they're not uh, stuck in the mud a lot of times as they're moving through or, or making ruts and things. So the, the growers like those grassy water, uh, inner rows, um, but we try to minimize the competition by doing most of our water and nutrient application in that weed-free zone. Now, you know, to, to, to try to automate or try to improve uh, you know, in a site-specific way, water and nutrient application. Uh, water, because it is in a micro sprinkler situation, we can put all kinds of different zones together and, and automated valves to operate those zones. And that's not a big issue. Um, but you're then applying, you know, uh, water to a fairly large area where you may want to try to target fertility pretty specifically to, to, to a, a given tree, depending on its its need. And we actually, we're pretty excited about it. One of our growers, that's a cooperator, one of our former grad students that went back and now operates uh, one of these orchards, um, just came into uh, a, a fertilizer spreader that he has that can target individual trees uh, with an RTK driven map system um, where we could actually feed in our base maps uh, uh, to it, uh, and uh, it, it will apply a very specific amount of fertilizer tree by tree as it goes down the row, which is pretty exciting when we think about uh, we don't have to then try to route fertigation in, in smaller, smaller blocks uh, independent of the irrigation uh, to accomplish that. So, if I may, um, so when there is an orchard replacement. It, do they um, use those grassy strips to plant the new crops in and, and kind of start fresh? Or do they tend to go back to the same spots? I'm just thinking, you know, on one hand, you may have a buildup of fertility, but you may also have a buildup of salts. Uh, yeah, so and, 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 root, and root diseases and other things. <laughs> yeah, so, true. but uh, they, 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 uh, they, they try to basically keep them pretty much the same, but they do, they do tear them up pretty good when they replace an orchard. So they'll, they'll cut the trees down, but then they'll come through with like a, a big cat uh, with the claw and then just uproot everything, all the stumps. And so it, it's, it's pretty destructive of, of, of the whole system. And so when they go back in, they'll replant those grassways and, and, and everything else after they've uh, put the new trees in. Um, but, uh, they, they, uh, it, 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 yeah, it's a, it's quite an operation when they, when they do replant these orchards. Uh, Grant, I have a question. So for, for irrigation management, do they use any kind of, uh, soil moisture sensors, or I know there are some sensors that you can, you know, in tree production that usually use that, that goes on the stem and measures water potential. Yeah. Uh, some of our best 
growers, um, the, the ones that we use that one block I said that was annually fertilized and they're really, really on top of things. They have uh, one of these diviner capacitance probes that uh, they have a number of different access ports uh, throughout the orchard, their orchard blocks. And they have one person assigned to go in and, and make daily soil moisture readings with that uh, capacitance probe uh, throughout their orchard blocks. And uh, so they get a really good idea of what their day-to-day -day water uh, application needs are within each block. Um, We've been trying to get the growers that we're cooperating with to use the watermark sensors. Uh, Matt Yost has established uh, a number of these orchards uh, set up those with uh, uh, watermark sensors within, within the tree line and at depth uh, through the profile um, so that we can begin to get some good soil moisture data out of those and show them how to use that in, in managing their irrigation. But a lot of them are just on we do it every Wednesday or we do it every Thursday, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and they don't really divide up the blocks in any systematic way. It's just, we, we can, we have so much flow, we can operate, you know, X number of lines uh, at a time. And that's pretty much what they're doing in a lot of these, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, because they are pressurized systems. They are mostly uh, set up with, uh, you know, good micro sprinkler systems, um, retrofitting them with uh, with some automated valves and things like that would not be nearly as, uh, not that big an issue in order, you know, to form smaller and smaller management blocks for irrigation. Yeah.